learning from failure. Uh, before we begin, I would like to discuss a few meeting logistics. All attendees are being muted and your video is turned off, and this is in order to prevent background noise and save bandwidth. The chat box is also turned off for this webinar, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to submit questions and comments to the presenters. If you're having technical difficulties, please reach out to Stephanie Bricking or Betsy Hedler for assistance, and I'll be putting their contact information in the chat in a moment. Follow this meeting on Twitter using the hashtag uh, SOAAM20. And the session is being recorded and a link will be sent out to all SOA attendees after the meeting. So with that, I'm gonna get started by introducing our speakers. So this morning we'll have five speakers in a panel. Uh, they will each take about five to seven minutes to tell you about some experiences that they've had in their, in their jobs that have maybe not gone so successfully. Um, and then there will be plenty of time for discussion and conversation at the end of all of their presentations. So please do hold your questions. Feel free to type them in chat, but the speakers will respond to questions um, after they've all finished presenting. And they would also like to hear from you about similar experiences that you've had. So be thinking about those and if you have something you want to share. So our speakers will be this morning. Uh, first up, we'll have Colette McDonough. So Colette is the archivist and library manager at the Kettering Foundation. Her main responsibilities include processing the foundation's collections, conducting essential low-level conservation, preparing collection guides, and adding and updating records in the foundation's archival database. She provides reference and research support by assisting other employees. She also handles interlibrary loan and manages the library journal subscriptions. McDonough is a certified archivist and an active member of the Society of American Archivists and the Society of Ohio Archivists. She holds an MA in history with an emphasis in public history and a BA in history with an emphasis in Eastern European history from Wright State University. Next up is Sarah Eisenbray, who has worked in the museum and archives field professionally since her graduation from Wright State University with a master's in public history in 2014. She's been the archivist for the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Dayton, Ohio since 2018. Then we'll have Amy Rollmiller, who is the Associate University Archivist at the University of Dayton, where she works to preserve and provide access to the works in university archives and special collections. She successfully wrote and managed a 2019 LSTA conservation grant to preserve a collection of medieval manuscripts. She previously worked at the Ohio History Connection, where she coordinated Ohio's statewide commemorations of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War and 100th anniversary of World War I as well as managing the Ohio History Service Corps AmeriCorps program and its 10 members. She received a BA in history from Case Western Reserve University and an MA in public history from Middle Tennessee State University and an MSLIS from Syracuse University. Uh, next up, we'll have Tina Ratcliffe, who is a graduate of Ohio University and Wright State University. She's worked for the Montgomery County Record Center and Archives in Dayton, Ohio for the past 25 years. She has been the Montgomery County Records and Information Manager since 2011. She is the current chair of the Ohio Historical Records Advisory Board, the central body for historical records planning in the state of Ohio. And then rounding out the panel this morning will be Adam Wanter, who is the Digital and Special Collections Archivist for the Midpoint Library Systems. He is in charge of managing the Midpoint's local history and genealogy collections, both physical and digital. And with that, I will turn this over to our panelists. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Colette McDonough. I'm going to be starting off. Uh, let me just share my screen. There we go. Can you guys all see it? Hearing no one complain, I guess I'm going to go ahead. So welcome to Crash and Burn, Learning from Failure. Uh, oh. I'm Colette McDonough. I'm an archivist and library manager at the Kettering Foundation. We are a uh, nonprofit organization that uh, does uh, re research work into how to make, basically answering the question of how to make democracy work as it should. And 
actually this is uh, needs to be updated. I'm owned by two cats now because I just recently got a new one. Do, do, do. Jean Krantz once said, failure is not an option. Luckily, we're not, uh, we don't work for NASA. We're all archivists here. And uh, we have a little wiggle room for failure. And often it's a great way to learn and make us better at our jobs. Charles F. Kettering once said, one fails towards success. He was all about learning from failure, making the most out of failure. It seems while uh, we archivists are not one to point out our failures, uh, these are, can be a great resource for learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if we fail intelligently. So what do I mean by that? It means not letting these failures go to waste. It's an opportunity to learn. It means each time you fail, whether it be large or small, you need to take time to think about why you failed and how you could do the job better. Did you not have support from your manager and or zero, little, uh, zero money for the project? Did you not have proper equipment? Did someone drop the ball? Did a major pandemic ruin your great summer activities that you had, had planned for your archive? It was the belief of Charles F. Kettering that an invent, the inventor and social philosopher, he said, it's not a disgrace to fail. Failing is one of the greatest arts in the world. He also said, here's another one, an inventor fails 99, 999 times. If he succeeds once, he's in. He treats his failures as simply practice shots. We've all had projects that have crashed and burned. Sometimes these projects don't even get the chance to get off the ground, as in my case. Um, as in uh, with my intent to have a digital archiving software. One of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Top Gun. Maverick does in fact crash and burn. Uh, at first he leaves the Top Gun program and eventually overcomes his depression over the loss of his dear friend and is eventually offered a position teaching up top, uh, top Gun. On a side note, Top Gun 2 is supposed to be coming out this month and uh, it, because of COVID-19, it is now on hold, much to my dismay. It's gonna be awesome, guys. I started working at the Kettering Foundation in 2005. Uh, my contract was not renewed in 2008. And then I came back in 2010 and was offered a full-time job in two 2013. In 2011, I really started pushing for having some sort of digital plan because we had nothing, nothing. Uh, <coughs> uh, so I first started putting that out there and nobody was interested um, and um, the big thing is there was a lot of roadblocks uh, people at the foundation especially upper management are afraid of change when it comes to technology and in fact the cloud is a four-letter word at the foundation if you know what I mean um, in 2012 I decided to take a different approach and uh, decided to get some training through SAA on digital archiving. And this was quickly like, oh, great. Yeah, sure, do that. Uh, so I got like three or four of the classes. I did not get my DAS uh, certification. And um, so these classes were incredibly important because now I had the uh, vocabulary and more knowledge about how this is important. Despite this new knowledge, oops, Uh, my pursuit for digital archiving software came up dry. First of all was the cost. I should have done my homework. Um, I was not aware of the uh, large price tag on most of these and uh, of course then there's a few free ones but they weren't going to really work with what we had. Uh, so I should have avoided uh, the sticker shock by making my uh, co-workers aware of 
the cost. Second was KIMS. Uh, KIMS is a catch-all database. KIMS is, stands for Kettering Information Management System. And they already dropped a lot of money on this about 12 years ago now. And it does a so-so job for pretty much everything. It's for the library, it's for the archive, it's for our contacts, it's for the contracts, it's all of it. And it does all of it, meh, okay, not really great. And then, of course, there was the issues with the IT staff. Basically, they thought I was stepping on their toes by saying, basically, you know, they thought that I was not saying, saying they weren't doing a very good job. Um, I assumed they would be willing to help and slowly getting, I've been slowly getting them to understand uh, the importance of digital archiving and how it's different than just putting something in a uh, general server. And um, it has helped that we've changed IT companies and I have been bribing them with cookies. Um, I have made some progress, despite the fact I do not have a digital archiving software. Um, we have a special spot in the, on the general server just for the archive that only four people have access to before everybody had access to it and they could even delete things. Uh, making some headway with the IT staff. Uh, realize they've you know, taken a few of the free or really, really cheap uh, SA cl classes about understanding the uh, importance of uh, digital archiving. And now we finally have off-site backups, which before the backups were just in another building. So if a tornado would have came through, it would have destroyed the main building and the other building. Uh, so now they are in Chicago. I finally was able to make that win of the importance of off-site backups. Well, um, each one of these, you know, I wasn't able to really, you know, get the software I wanted, but everyone was a little bit of a win. Um, failure is kind of like, you know, when you're a kid riding a bike and uh, when you fail, fell off the bike, you didn't just run away and then you know never look at it again. Your parents picked you up, kissed your boo-boos, and you know you got right back on that bike. Uh, so every time you fail at archiving, at a small project, a big project, you need to just get right back on that bike and eventually you'll come up with a real cool thing. And that is all I have. and I will stop sharing. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, I'm next. So I'm gonna share my screen as well here. Okay, hopefully everyone can see. Um, and we're good to go. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, whoa, let's go back. <laughs> okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Sarah Eisenbray and I am the archivist for the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Dayton, Ohio. And today I'm gonna talk about the failures and challenges I've experienced with inventory in the archives. Um, I am in the beginning stages of this project, so I'm sure that I would have a lot to add on to this presentation if I were to repeat it again in a year. Um, the main focus of this presentation is the data entry portion of the inventory, so how I'm keeping track of information. Um, the thing about databases is they're amazing when you have a plan and I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, so to begin, um, tracking was very clunky. Um, I was using a bit of a complicated system um, that involved um, Microsoft Excel and, um, there we go. Um, and Microsoft Word. So essentially keeping information in two different places. So the screenshot on the bottom of the slide shows the Excel spreadsheet. 
of the box information. Um, and then the screenshot on the right side of the slide shows you the Word document with the detailed box and folder information. Um, so to figure out what is in a box, first you had to open the Excel spreadsheet and find what you're looking for and hope for no misspellings, um, just in case you wanted to keyword search something. And then once you find the box you want, you have to determine whether or not the box has description files, which is what we call finding aids. Um, and our finding aids are all um, just for staff, so they're not um, for the public use. Um, if you're lucky enough to find a box with description files, you open the Word document and then hopefully you can find the box and the information that you need. And if the box does not have description files, then you have to physically go to the box and open it um, to figure out what's in it. And this is fine mostly, but since I'm what they call a loan arranger, um, I have to be careful with how I manage my time. Um, and searching through boxes to find what I want is usually not the best use of that time. Um, and let me say that Word and Excel are great and reliable programs, but I think in an archives like the one that I work in, um, which I would call small to medium size, um, a software package that allows us to automate these corrections, connections is a great help, um, which is why I went ahead and purchased PassPerfect for us. Now, I talked um, at great length with someone from PassPerfect support, um, and I decided to utilize the multi-level description function to catalog the boxes and the folders. Um, this was a decision I came to after trying to input maybe 10 documents on item level. So basically cataloging every single page um, inside of a folder. And basically I wanted to throw my computer across the room. Um, I would be there for 190 years if I decided to continue with that. So I decided with the boxes and the folders. Um, and this has been a much easier process. And I can always enter specific documents that are of high research or historical value on that item level if I decide I want to do that. So to give a bit of an explanation of what I'm talking about, um, here is the general archive screen of Past Perfect, and you'll see that this is a record for a box. So object name is box. Here you'll notice I have a circle on the right showing the multi-level description field. This is a drop-down menu that allows you to choose the level. So this record is a box, but I can choose folder, collection, item, etc. And so you can see a pop out of that there. Um, and with PassPerfect, you can add or eliminate as many levels of these as you want. So on the bottom left, you'll see view slash setup links. And when you click that, you get this screen called multi-level linking. So this gives you all the information on what records are connected. And you can add links, change links, or remove them. This is basically like a set of nesting dolls where the biggest one goes on top, then the next biggest, and then the next biggest. I've included a photo of some adorable Mickey Mouse dolls for reference at the top left of the screen. So this is the collection level, the highest level. And this is like the Mickey Mouse of the nesting dolls. It houses all the smaller levels in it. And then you see the information on the box itself. This number is what is on the box. So that 1044 is the number of the box in the archives. And then this is the next smallest level, or as I will call it today, the Minnie Mouse level. Um, and I thought she was a little creepy because she doesn't have ears, but I went with it anyway. And finally, you can see all the folders inside of the box. And then each folder has a basic description of what's in it. And all these descriptions are searchable. And then this is the smallest level or the Donald Duck level for our purposes today. So some pros and cons with this system. Um, the pros of this system is that it's much easier to manage. Everything is in one place and I can quality check to make sure I don't have misspellings so I can search keywords easily. Um, I'm also familiar with PassPerfect. I've used it in previous jobs. Um, so that also made this an easier process for me. Um, and bonus, since um, in our archives, we also have photos, library information, objects. Um, I can connect all of those to the archival records if I so choose to do that. 
the cons, um, if, I had a, if I have a research request um, and I don't already have the data in Past Perfect, I have to continue to refer back to that Excel document um, system. And this is definitely understandable. Um, it's just a part of this transition. Um, also, entering records is a bit time consuming, but luckily I have a lot of podcasts to listen to, um, and this will definitely be worth it um, in the end. And future Sarah will save lots of time. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, I was entering the records by item level at first, so each page. Um, so I would say the last con was my bad attitude, which I have since rectified. So this process is still not perfect. Um, all of these boxes are yet unprocessed, so I guess I have job security, which is good. Um, but as Virginia Wigant says, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Now, I added this onto the presentation, um, just some pandemic things that I've picked up. Um, and I figure I'd say a couple things about this because this is a difficult time and we're all kind of navigating through this. Um, so I worked at home for over two months. I'm back in the office now, um, not today because probably sisters would come in and try to talk to you all and that would be not helpful. Um, but one thing I've learned is that it will be there when you get back. So the records aren't going to grow legs and walk away while you're gone. Um, and most people have been extremely patient during all of this. When I tell them I can't get to their record request right away. Um, and now that I'm back in the office, I'm kind of backlogged. So that's still going to be the case for a while. And to focus on what you can control, this one is pretty self-explanatory. So donate, advocate, and be awesome. And all I need to know, I learned from my cat. <laughs> all right, that's it for me. Thank you. All right, that means that I am up next. Let me share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Okay, um, my name is Amy Romiller and I am the Associate University Archivist at the University of Dayton. Um, but before that, I was the uh, Civil War 150 coordinator and the uh, Ohio World War I Centennial Coordinator at the Ohio History Connection. Okay, it looks like you're not seeing it full screen, so I'm gonna stop this and try again. I'm really sorry, bear with me. One more time. Um, so basically, the um, past 10 years have been dedicated in some way or another to a really major uh, military commemoration, uh, which was interesting for me as I am not a military historian. Uh, both of these commemorations uh, had major websites, which I think is how most people interacted with these commemorations. Um, both commemorations were overseen by advisory committees, part of whose job was to help me come up with content for the websites. Um, and both of these websites had blogs uh, that were created as our primary outreach tool, uh, not only for what the statewide commemorations were doing, uh, but for ways for people around the state to uh, also do outreach for their own collections. Uh, in theory, doing these blogs was a really, really good idea um, because like I said, it gave us an opportunity to highlight these collections from around the state. Um, it was designed to get away from a very Columbus-centric idea of things, um, a chance to give other repositories and local history organizations 
a way to share their really interesting stories and collections um, that are very often buried in their archives and, and don't get much attention outside of um, their very local area. Uh, for me, from a coordinator perspective, it was a great opportunity um, to kind of outsource a little bit of my job um, and bring in other people to help create web content. Um, at every advisory committee meeting, I would have the committee generate themes and post ideas and we would assign authors to these posts or advisory committee members who would be responsible for finding an author. Um, so that it wasn't just me trying to keep this website up to date. There was also a potential to reach a much wider audience uh, by having these things on the central commemoration website, especially the World War I site, um, because that was hosted by the National World War I commemoration. And uh, they would often pick up things from the state websites and, and show, um, aggregate them to their national audience. Uh, this was also a really good way to help us tell non-traditional stories about these conflicts. Um, most people are into military history for the battles um, and the tactics and the generals and things like that, uh, but we really saw this as a good opportunity to tell stories about the home front, about what was happening socially and culturally, um, what was happening with women or African Americans, and really expand the story beyond what you traditionally think of when you think of these wars. Um, so in short, it was supposed to be a really high return on investment idea. Um, but as you can probably guess, it failed. And not only did this fail once, um, the definition of insanity is to do the exact same thing again. And it didn't quite work out for the Civil War 150. Uh, so we decided to try it again for World War I. And lo and behold, it didn't exactly work out that way either. Uh, and the biggest drawback um, for why this particular outreach project failed is that it just ended up being an incredibly low priority for everybody involved. Um, it just sunk to the bottom of everybody's to-do list. I was simultaneously trying to do another job as a coordinator, uh, running the Ohio History Connections AmeriCorps program. The advisory committee members also all had full-time jobs. Um, so while everything sounded great while we were in the room during the meetings, once you were back dealing with your real job and the day-to-day -day involved with that, just nobody had time to write the posts or to find authors. Um, this could have worked better if I had had the time to be more consistent with reminding people what they had signed up to do, um, but I just didn't have the time either. So some lessons learned. Uh, I learned this one over and over and over in my life that everything takes more time than I think it will. Um, making sure that content happened took more time than I think it would. I think the advisory committee members would tell you that writing and finding content uh, took more time than they thought it would when they enthusiastically volunteered to help with this while uh, we were in the meetings. Just everything will inevitably end up being more involved than you think it is, even if it's the world's greatest idea and is totally worth doing. Um, another lesson I learned is that you really have to incentivize participation. Um, I ended up doing this in some ways uh, by um, having the AmeriCorps members who I managed uh, contribute some content to both of these blogs um, and pitching it to them as a way to get a publication for their resume. I have carried this forward into my current position that UD Libraries also has a blog. Um, and so once we know that our student workers are good writers, we will often have them uh, write a blog post for the UD Libraries blog about what they've been working on for us or cool things that they've found in our collections. Um, it's a good project for them. It gets them writing skills and then it gives them a concrete resume line to come out of their work for us. Uh, it's really, despite my best efforts to try and 
outsource content creation. Um, it really only works if you have a primary content creator um, and then clear their schedule enough to make sure that they actually have time to create content. After I uh, left the Ohio History Connection, um, I had designated this to um, one of our AmeriCorps members whose one of his primary roles was to make sure that the um, World War I blog stayed consistently updated and it was the perfect role for him because he loved World War I history, he loved doing research, and he loved doing writing. Um, so he could just make sure that that blog was consistently updated. And then the last thing uh, is to make sure that you are writing easy evergreen content that can just go in whenever you have a space for it. Not everything has to be a magnum opus. I think in the beginning, my historian training was like, I need to have a thousand beautiful words with a perfectly formed argument uh, about this thing that I'm writing about. And really, nobody cares. Blog posts should be short, pithy, punchy, um, and with immigrants. And that if I was just writing little things whenever I had time, I could throw them into the blog uh, whenever I needed to. And so that is my last lesson. And with that, I will turn it over to Tina. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is my first Zoom conference that I'm uh, being a presenter on. So uh, I don't have any uh, cool uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm Tina Ratcliffe. I'm with the Montgomery County Records Center and Archives. Uh, when Colette came up with this presentation, I thought it was really interesting because I think for archivists, a lot of us are perfectionists and for better or for worse, we love to see those big rows of uh, gray boxes all neatly laid out and all the file folders in order. It's, it, it makes us really happy. Um, and, but I don't think, for, especially for young archivists, I think that being a perfectionist is hard. Uh, I think sometimes the, that first failure they have in their career that really sets them back and uh, causes them a great deal of problems. So uh, I think this is a good presentation for somebody, especially young archivists, to listen to. Um, I, I have to say that uh, thinking about failure for the last few weeks has not been good for my mental health. Uh, I've tended to uh, stomp around the office and see all the projects that were supposed to get done that haven't been done. Uh, and getting mad and scowling at employees for, for and they don't know why. Um, but yeah, one of the uh, failures uh, from this pandemic I've had is uh, uh, I arranged to have a nice new conference room and chairs, new chairs, and, and uh, I was going to have meetings with my young uh, employees who really don't like to meet in person. They prefer to text and email. Uh, I had one meeting uh, and then COVID-19 hit. So uh, my conference room is no more. <laughs> so uh, much to my employees' delight. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of failure here at the Record Center and Archives. And uh, so the, the, I've really uh, learned three things. Um, is coming from a government uh, perspective. The first thing is, um, if you have more than two departments involved in a project, you're doomed. Uh, it, it's just not gonna work. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people know that here at the Record Center Archives, we had a great deal of problems with mold. Uh, we had mold on four floors of our uh, office. And, and if you can imagine, the Record Center and Archives is, uh, takes up about a whole city block of downtown Dayton. So that, that's a lot of mold to deal with. And, uh, you know, it started out with me saying to somebody, hey, there's mold. Uh, and then it went from my supervisor up to the manager and still we were doing okay. Uh, but then it involved facilities management, uh, the county administrator's office, uh, all the elected officials. So, you know, by the time of the end of everything, uh, it, was, it was about eight departments were involved in trying to solve this issue, and uh, none of them did well. Uh, so, uh, you know, it just kind of never got solved, and this went on for a couple of years. Um, so, you know, it, it, when you just have too many people involved with a problem, with a project, it, it's, you're just not going to do well. 
so, and my recommendation is always, if you're starting with a project, have two people involved at the very beginning, invite people in as you're going along. But uh, if, it does, if everything crashes and burns, uh, you'll know why, you got too many people. Uh, the second thing I've learned is that uh, you can turn failure into career opportunities. Um, we had this mold issue. Uh, it hadn't been solved. Again, it's going on for two or three years. Uh, and we got a new records manager. Uh, and I waited until it was a good day when my supervisor was out of the building. And I said, hey, you want to learn about our mold issue? And she, nobody had told her. And uh, so, you know, I, I showed her and um, suddenly everything got started because she was a germaphobe. Uh, she hated mold, she loved to clean. Uh, so we got a lot of action going and I moved up from being a technician to being a supervisor. Uh, and uh, she wore herself out so much working on this mold issue and other issues that she retired early and I got to be manager. Uh, so career opportunities, uh, turning failure into an opportunity is, is something that, that will happen to you in your career. Um, you know, even things that I have screwed up, uh, suddenly I can make it turn out to my, uh, my uh, elected officials like, oh yeah, I got that fixed. So, you know, it, failure becomes career opportunities. Uh, the next thing I, I've learned is uh, if you fall down seven times, you get up eight. Um, you have to be patient uh, with, when you're doing projects, when you're in a career, if your career is going to last for 20, 30 years, you're, you're going to have ups and downs. Um, so be patient with what you're doing and try things from different angles. If something didn't work out the first time, uh, try doing it from a different angle. Uh, so for instance, uh, with my conference room, which my young people in the office are going to have meetings in, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, try it from a different angle. The next time I'm, you know, once the COVID thing is over, uh, I'm going to invite one person into that, that meeting and then oh, hey, uh, all these other people are going to come in too and suddenly we're going to have conferences again and, and that's going to make me very happy. So, <laughs> so uh, that's kind of my presentation on failure. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Adam. Uh, thank you, Tina. Let's see if I can get this going. Uh, can you see that? Okay. Um, I think we're good. All right. So, uh, Hi, I'm Adam Wanter, um, and my portion of the uh, presentation will be focusing on timelines and how I failed to give myself enough time to fully complete a uh, specific project, a uh, digitization project at that. So a little bit more about me. Um, the, this project took place uh, at Midpoint Library System. Um, as mentioned earlier, I was in, char I'm in charge of the library's local history and genealogy material, um, both physical and digital, with a primary focus on our digital historic collections. Um, Midpoint is a medium-sized public library system that services Eastern Butler County. At the time of this project, we had like two and a half employees, including myself, working on digitization related projects. Um, most digitization work itself was outsourced um, with the metadata work being done in-house because we didn't have enough staff to really digitize works. Uh, the collection specifically was the Virginia Sheet Walters Letters Collection, um, which was a letters collection from World War II from a local resident who served in the WAC slash WAC from 1942 to 1945. The project was a collaboration with the Westchester and Union Township Historical Society. They owned the materials or were the repository of the materials and we'd reach out to, to them to partner with them to digitize it um, while they kept the materials themselves. The library was responsible for rehousing, processing, uh, creating a finding aid, um, let's see, uh, digitizing materials, hosting the materials, uh, and then creating programming and um, educational resources 
after the project was completed. Uh, so my, my error came when to complete the project, I had applied for and was awarded two local grants. And when applying for the grants um, and working with our partners, I developed uh, mostly arbitrary deadlines um, based more on gut and zeal than actual work completed. So based on the size of the project, as it was like 270 letters end up being about nine, 990 pages, including envelopes for digitization, I was pretty confident that my uh, assessment was, was accurate. Um, however, the time uh, line wasn't based on any actual work completed. I didn't do any samples or anything. I just kind of figured, oh, there's just many letters. They're in these binders. I can move those over and rehouse them, get everything ready and get them shipped out and all that stuff and have them transcribed in no time. It'll be, it'll be fine. Um, but I didn't put in much actual work doing any tests to see how things were going to work. So uh, the source of my failure was really just overconfidence and not really doing the prep work to make sure that I knew what was gonna happen when the project got started. So as you can guess, uh, when I did start working on the project, uh, processing took longer than expected. I found out that even though the letters were in, in uh, binders, um, they weren't in great binders, but they were in binders. They weren't actually in any kind of order. The historical society had gotten the letters and then kind of just um, over time had taken them out, looked at them, put them in different binders. They weren't in any chronological order or, in, or any kind of order whatsoever. And, and some of the envelopes weren't with the correct uh, letters. So you could tell that someone had looked at a couple letters and then put them back in the wrong order and whatnot. So I had to do a lot of work just kind of going through there and figuring out what letters went where, um, who was written to whom, and um, making sure the envelopes were with the correct letter which delayed the materials in getting uh, sent out for digitization, which then pushed back my timeline. Uh, so digitization thankfully went pretty smoothly, but next the transcription project took much longer than anticipated. Thankfully we weren't, tra weren't transcribing them ourselves, but we had um, at the time was Backstage Library Works working on the transcription. They, all the letters were handwritten and in cursive, so we couldn't OCR them. So we, had, we hired a transcription service. Um, but the sample they had said, oh, take this much time. It actually took them, I think, about a month longer than anticipated. Uh, the good news with that was it came under budget. They charge you per character, and we were under character there, but um, which led to some other issues with having too much grant money, and I had to figure out ways to do that. So finally, once I got the collection back with my shortened timeline now, I found out that to create all the metadata I, I wanted to make, to make this nice, robust uh, collection was going to take much longer than I had and much longer than I had originally anticipated. So I had to really cut back on that. So with all these mistakes and errors, um, I didn't account for a shrinking amount of time. Um, so I had to just cut whole parts of the project. Uh, the first thing to go was the amount of metadata we were creating for each uh, record. It just wasn't as much um, we had to cut out some optimal fields that really would have enhanced the record and we could have done some cool stuff with it. So I had, I had to go right off the bat. Um, the next thing we had to do is I had to completely cut off the educational and uh, uh, educational portion of the project. We never got any teaching resources, anything related to it um, under the guise that I would work on it later, but it just it hasn't happened yet. And I don't know if it will happen in the future along with the metadata. I figured we'd go back and work on it, but with other projects always coming in, it just hasn't happened. Um, so yeah, it was just a real shame because it, it was a really cool aspect. Um, and she was a local teacher herself, so it wasn't really a cool tie to try to get some education resources out there, some really good primary resources for students to use, but it just hasn't happened and I'm not sure it will. Um, so the project was, I was able to complete the project just in a really compact and cut down version. Um, and you can view the project there and then since today is June 17th, I was able to find a letter for today specifically. Um, so the lessons learned. Always know what you're working with. It really, and this is also learned for some of the lessons, but having a good idea, good understanding of what materials you're working with or what collection you're working with and what kind of work is actually going to need to take. Don't just assume that, you know, you're looking at something that you know everything about that collection. Um, have a clear sense of what it would take to accomplish all of your goals and kind of be honest with yourself about those. 
be able to prioritize outcomes so in case things do go wrong, you know what you need to get done and what you want to get done. Be flexible and then manage expectations throughout the project. Uh, be open and transparent, especially with uh, partners. This is something I really learned is that you always tell them like, here's what we can do, here's what we wanna do, and like, here's, if that doesn't happen, what we are going to do. And so, yeah, now we'll open it up, I think. For uh, questions. Oh, and these are my pups. How do I don't share? Oh, yes. Okay, I think now's the question portion. So everybody can feel free to go ahead and you can pop questions in the Q&A, a uh, little option down at the bottom of the screen if you want to. Um, and so I'll give everybody a chance to do that while you're thinking about questions that you might want to ask the panel. And you can ask a question of anyone in particular or the panel all together. Um, I have a question just to get started. So I thought it was interesting. All of you mentioned various times of being frustrated or things sort of went wrong and you had a very sort of negative reaction to things. So can you talk about some strategies you used to help you get out of that place and get your momentum back um, to progress in the project? Um, I, I can. Guess I'll go. Oh, well, <laughs> Colette, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm lucky to ha be a, you know, pretty much a lone ranger for a good portion of my time at the F Kettering Foundation. So when I do get frustrated with a project, I can literally go and move on to, you know, and take that hat off and put one of the various other hats on and then have some time to think about it, maybe go on a little nature walk because at the foundation we have a nature trail and I can, you know, get out of that space and then, you know, you know, even maybe work, work on it the, the next day and just look at it with a fresh set of eyes. Colette, I was going to say a very similar thing um, that uh -huh. I can get up and walk away from the situation and then also having um, positive things around me, like even just my computer desktop says be positive. <laughs> um, and that um, has really helped me too. It just helps you focus. Um, and also remembering that, um, you know, deep down, we all have a huge passion for this field and remembering that and recentering yourself is really helpful. I'll just quickly add that with this, like I may do digitization work and my thinking always is something is better than nothing, especially with getting resources out there that are kind of locked away or in our library down in the basement or in a historical society, just getting them online and out there with, with basic metadata is better for people and provide access than them being there and people not knowing. So it's always like, it may not be perfect. Like, I guess the thing is like, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So always just keep working and yeah, because it's better than nothing. Okay, so we've got some questions coming in. Um, the first one is for Adam. And Adam, can you talk about when you first realized the project was not going the way you wanted it to? I think it really was like when I started processing the collection, it was just right off the, basically right off the bat, like, because I had seen the collection with the historical society, they had brought it to me, shown it to me, but I never actually had complete, I don't know, not ownership, but had it all in my hands per se. So like once they finally dropped it off after we were awarded the grants, I got it into my hands and started working on it. And I was like, oh man, this is going to take so much longer than I had anticipated. So it was right off the bat, I was like, um, so right then and there, I started thinking like, what can, where can I start cutting corners, I guess, or making sure that I, I Get this completed because we had an exhibit or an exhibit and a function at the that was planned already so it's like we have to be done by this date because the room is booked we have like speakers coming in you know people are expecting this to happen here so i have to get something done by then does that answer the question i think um We'll say yes. Um, we'll let, if there was a follow-up, we'll let somebody uh, ask you a follow-up to that. Uh, so we have a question for Sarah about Past Perfect. So Sarah, you mentioned that it was easy to connect photos, books, and other items. Um, the question is how? Um, and can you upload photos of physical items to connect to the inventory list in Past Perfect? And also um, wondering if Past Perfect has OCR compatibility. 
Okay, so um, as far as um, connecting uh, photos together um, with different records, um, it's hard to show you without having a physical database in front of me. Um, but basically, um, there are different catalogs within PassPerfect, and then um, you can connect those um, just by entering the record, and then you can um, put those together just with the click of a button. Um, if you go to museumsoftware.org, that is their website, um, and their support people are great, and you don't have to pay um, to talk to them. They will talk to you um, about anything, even if um, you aren't going to buy the software or anything like that. Um, and then, yes, you can upload photos of physical items. Um, that's relatively easy to do as well. You can just um, connect your camera to the computer just as normal and upload um, like you were going to upload a photo to Facebook or <laughs> anything like that. Um, and then as far as OCR compatibility, um, I have not used PassPerfect for that before. I've always used um, Abby Fine Reader for that and then um, put any transcriptions. You can copy and paste the text of the transcription into PassPerfect. Um, that would be a great question for their um, support because I've never used it in that capacity before, but I'm sure that they would be able to answer that question better than I can. So we have a comment or a question for everybody. So the comment is uh, enthusiastically, this was extremely, extremely relatable content. Um, so the question is if you have any advice on how to document your failures and possible solutions if you found them so that the next person doesn't have to make the same mistakes that you did. I guess I'll start. <clears throat> um, well, you, we, we have monthly reports, uh, which are very help, helpful if you have to go back uh, for years and years uh, to figure out when a problem started and how, it, uh, how it's played out. Um, so, you know, just, I, I think uh, in uh, government, we call that documentation. So uh, you're documenting what's going on and, and then how, what the solution is. I, I think that that works much better than going back and trying to do uh, reports later. Uh, so I say continual documentation is my uh, recommendation. No. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Adam. No, I've, I've now that you brought that up, it's a really good point. And I think I just get so focused on like, oh, next product, next product, next product, that I haven't really thought about the person that will come after me. So I guess that's like a good thing to start thinking about actually. Um, I'm pretty bad about like documenting the failure as it happens, but I am kind of obsessed with documenting um, processes once I've figured out how they worked for the people who come after me. So I have not done a good job of leaving a paper trail of like, oh my god, this failed. Um, but I think I have like a bullet pointed list of like, once I figured it out, like this is the way to do it or the way that I figured out the best way to do it to give the people who come after me a starting point, and if they can tweak it and make it even better from there, that's awesome. But it, it might be more helpful to be like, I tried this and it didn't work. Okay, so we have another question for everyone on the panel. Um, I think also relatable for a lot of us. Uh, advice on how do you handle supervisors or other higher ups who don't understand how long these projects take um, the comment is they manage by wishful thinking, not reality. And I'll relate to that. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one. Uh, I have managers upstairs uh, that barely have been in the archive. And so I have a, uh, a newish uh, supervisor and um, she's more of an IT kind of person, which is 
great in some ways, but when it comes to the hard uh, copy stuff, not so much. And um, so we have a, a larger collection that came in. It's uh, more than 400 boxes. And so she was asking me like, okay, you know, when is this going to get done? Because we had, you know, got a, um, an intern to help. And she was basically expecting this to be done and taken care of within three months. I'm like, um, no, I told you three years. Uh, so I actually had her come down and just look at it all and, you know, had her open a few boxes to see that there was most of the box, most of the uh, folders weren't even labeled uh, to just kind of ha help her realize how much work needed to be done. Uh, but maybe that doesn't work with everybody's bosses. I don't know. I think it's also helpful to be transparent from the beginning. Um, I don't know if it has, <laughs> if it had success in like changing the wishful thinking, but at least they were like constantly updated on, on where I was with things and why it was happening. Um, so nothing ever shouldn't have come as a surprise when things started to deviate from the plan because um, they knew exactly where my thoughts were and, and what had been happening behind it. And I'll say um, when you're dealing with supervisors, you have to realize that uh, unlike most artists, most of them are type A personalities. So uh, you have to uh, know that you have about two minutes to get their attention and explain why. So usually uh, when I'm dealing with elected officials is why is this project gonna make you look good? And if it's a complete failure, how is that gonna make you look bad? Uh, so, you know, you just, you just have to uh, uh, know you're gonna to have to do a presentation that's gonna be short, sweet, and to the point. We received, I think, an appropriate uh, follow-up comment in the chat that says, from a records manager who encourages us to maintain project files that where we document our successes and our failures and our lessons learned for revisiting the project. So we can, we can close the loop on our own. Um, okay, so we do have just a couple minutes left. Um, any, I don't have any more questions in the Q&A. If anybody has one, quickly, we have time for it. Otherwise, any last thoughts, any last advice that the panel wants to give folks? Um, any, can any of you share anything that you had had a failure with on a project where you were able to apply a lesson later on and make it a success on a different project or different opportunity? I think it's like being transparent, I think it's really been helpful, especially when working with community partners, always just telling them how to explain the process to them because they, if they're infested, they want to know what's going on. I'm just telling them what's going to happen, and they're going to be more willing to work with you again. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming to our uh, uh, panel this morning. Thank you to all of our panelists. And we will have, a, yes, Betsy is reminding us there'll be a session evaluation that will pop up when you leave this uh, session. So please do take a moment to fill that out. We would really appreciate that. Um, and we'll see you all at some uh, of the other sessions later today, hopefully. Thanks, everyone.